good to be in the house of the Lord. We've been talking about what does it mean to be a Pentecostal powerhouse. And when we look at it in the aspect that we're looking at it, we're looking at it in light of the person who, or lieu of the person who goes to the gym and is constantly working out, and maybe he has muscles upon muscles upon muscles, but he didn't get that way overnight. And yet so many times Christians think, well, I can start reading the Word of God and all of a sudden I'll be mighty and great. But the truth of the matter is if we're going to become powerful in the things of God, if we're going to become mighty in the Word of God, if we are going to become a Pentecostal powerhouse, it's only going to begin when we start doing it consistently on an everyday battle. We cannot try to read the Bible through it overnight and think that it's going to work. It's kind of like the person who's studying at the last minute for the test, so they cram everything the night before. It doesn't always turn out the best. But if they would have taken gradual steps and done it consistently, it would have stuck better. If we as Christians would pray every day, read our Bible every day, with them the intent to draw closer to God, we will slowly become a Pentecostal powerhouse. Because it will not happen overnight. The only way to learn the Word of God is to get into the Word of God on a daily basis. The only way to know God is to pray to Him and talk to Him and commune with Him on a daily basis. Now we are talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And the gifts of the Spirit, of course, are recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 all the way through verse, uh, chapter 14. That's where it's uh, we get the bulk of our information. And we've talked about the gifts of healing and the work of the miracles in the last two times that I talked. Just keep in mind when it comes to those two gifts, the difference is the gifts of miracles, uh, the gifts of healing deal with curing a sickness or an illness. And the work of the miracles is a demonstration of power. So there's two different ends. So some healings can be the work of the miracles, but not all healings are the work of the miracles. Now today we're going to talk about the gift of prophecy. And just on a side note, it's hard to teach on the gifts to begin with. It's even harder when you have not been using the gifts of the Spirit or have that gift in your life. So you're not quite sure how it works within the individual life itself. But we can talk more freely about ones that we have. And when it takes home, we can understand that a little bit better. So today we are going to talk about the gift of prophecy. We listed that there are three main categories in the Word of God when it comes to the gifts. This one falls under the gifts of inspiration. This is one of the gifts that we are more familiar with. Gift of prophecy, gift of tongues, gifts of interpretation. Some of the other gifts might be a little less known, and that's simply because not all of them are gifts that are demonstrated publicly. Gifts of faith, you may never see that in an individual's life unless you're looking closely. But the gift of prophecy is one that is used and comes out in a church service um, nine times out of ten. And when we look at the gifts of inspiration, they convey and express the emotions of God. When it comes to the gift of prophecy, it more specifically is the gift of utterance that gives expression to the feelings of God's heart, or what God is experiencing at that point in time. How many times have we been in a church service and we have heard the Holy Ghost express that He's um, he wants to draw us unto him. Or he wants to work in ways in our lives that we could never dream or imagine. He is expressing the heart of God. And when we look at the gift of prophecy as mentioned 22 times in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 through 14, and it is the only gift that we are instructed to covet 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 39. If someone would please read that. 1 Corinthians 14 and 39. 
mother to prophesy for men not to speak with tongues. <laughs> so we are instructed to covet prophesying. Sorry, I'm just trying to determine how I want to go in my notes. So what is prophecy? Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10 informs us what prophecy is. What is prophecy according to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10? disciples bear witness of them. Now we have to keep in mind that there is a difference between preaching and prophecy. There is a distinction between the two. This has been one of the arguments throughout the past that there have been preachers that got up and stood up and said that when I preach, I am prophesying. Preaching and prophesying are two different things. Prophecy, as we've already read, is the testimony of Jesus Christ. When we look at the Word of God, the Word of God is prophecy. The whole thing is prophecy. It's not prophesied, but it is prophecy. What is prophecy? The Greek word for prophecy. 
prophecy, as used in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10, is prophecia. And according to Strong's Greek Dictionary, it means to prophesy, prediction, whether it be scriptural or other. So when we look at prophecy, it's a prediction. Something that is going to come to pass. It is something future. So that is prophecy. To prophesy is prophecy. Or prophesying, I should say. Prophesying. To predict something that is in the future. It's not anything that is evident now, but it's something that's going to come later. For me to stand up here and say that after church I'm going to eat, that's, that's not prophecy. That's going to happen at some point. Unless some other miracle happens that I'm no longer here, I'm going to eat. That's not a big revelation. But we are talking about things that no one could ever foresee in their natural language or in their natural knowledge. That is us looking back to Dave, uh, David in his time frame as he's writing uh, verse, verse, Psalm chapter 22. If we would be sitting with him in that exact moment when the Holy Ghost was moving upon him, he was writing prophecy. He's describing the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. A, he's talking about the Messiah, somebody he's never met before. He's talking about events that he has no idea will ever come to pass. And C, he's describing in detail a torture method that has never, has not been invented yet and will not be invented for 500 years later. But for us to look back and preach about it, well, that's just preaching. That's not prophesying. We are talking about prophecy, but we are not prophesying. Howard Carter wrote that prophecy is not preaching. If this were actually so preparation for preaching might be unnecessary as one might wait for the anointing of the Spirit without any premeditation. The one who ministers should wait on his ministry. So what he's saying is, if preaching would be, to be the same thing as prophesying, there would be no need for preparation. All we would need is for the Holy Ghost to come upon us, and that would be it. But when it comes to preaching, there is a preparation. There is a praying. There is a praying for the service. There is a study of the Word of God. Maybe God's laid the message already on your heart. And you're already diving into it. You're already reading the passage. Maybe God's giving you a main text. You're studying and reading that passage. You're trying to study everything about the passage. And you're starting to see which direction. And you're waiting on God to see which way He wants you to prepare for the service. Prophesying is completely different. You just get out there and you let her rip. Donald G. made reference that there is a distinction between just preaching and anointed preaching, but that there is probably a much larger element of prophesying in some forms of inspirational preaching, or those that are anointed preaching, than in generally recognized. Can somebody who's preaching prophesy during the preaching? Absolutely, but preaching and prophesying are two different things. We've talked already that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. But we can preach the word of God, we can preach prophecy without prophesying because it's already come to pass, or it will come to pass, it's already known. And when we look at the word of God in general, when the men of God were writing the word of God, to them it was prophesying because they didn't know any of this before. The Holy Ghost moved upon men of old as they were inspired by the Holy Ghost. And I don't even know if it's that. I am so far off my notes at this point, so you'll have to forgive me. I'm just going. But wait. We know that the Holy Ghost men of old wrote as the Holy Ghost moved upon them. They were inspired. They didn't know that things that were going to come to pass. David didn't know anything about the crucifixion. He didn't know what was going to come to pass. He didn't know that uh, Jesus Christ was going to be betrayed by Judas. And we can go on and on and on with the prophecy of the Holy Ghost. And think about, and how do we know that the Bible is prophesying and that it was all under inspiration? It's because 
It all lines up perfectly. Over 40 different authors wrote as the Holy Ghost moved upon them, and it all lines up. They were prophesying. But for us to go back and preach the Word of God, we can preach prophecy, but we're not prophesying at that point in time. Because prophecy can be learned. If we go back in history, and they'll tell you before written history, you know how history was passed on? It was passed on orally. If we go back to the Old Testament, I'm sure there were men who were not educated. They could not read. They could not write. But yet they learned the Word of God. They maybe knew prophecies that the Messiah was going to come. And without being able to read or write, guess how they passed that on to their children and their grandchildren and they talked about the Messiah? Well, I just gave it away. But they did it orally. They talked about it. And because, and maybe their son or their daughter or their grandchildren weren't learned, so guess how they learned about it? How they remember the prophecy? It wasn't by reading it, but it was having it passed down through um, word of mouth. And it was learned. And how do we know that? Let me find it in my notes. Because I know I wrote it down somewhere. I find Proverbs 31 1. I think it's Proverbs 31 1. Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 1. I thought I had this in your notes. I don't see it. Excuse me with a quick glance. But Proverbs 31 and verse 1. The words of King Lemuel. The prophecy that his mother taught him. To, is it in the notes? Okay, then I just overlooked it. Like I said, I am all over my notes at this point. So prophecy can be taught, but prophecy is not prophesying. Prophesying is talking about a future event. And prophecy can be learned. But just because somebody gets up and we talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ and the rapture happening, we're not prophesying. We're talking about prophecy. There is a difference. To prophesy is to bring forth a word of God that is not already known. And what is the purpose of prophesying? We find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians 14 and 3. He that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. So he that prophesied speaketh unto men in edification, exhortation, and comfort. So the first thing listed there is, is meant to edify the church. You still have that passage wrong? What does verse 4 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 state? He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, and he that prophesieth edifieth the church. He that <laughs> prophesieth edifieth the church. Is Paul condemning the individual who speaks in an unknown tongue? He's not, he is not condemning that individual in any way. When we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, what Paul is doing is he's giving instruction, instruction on the gifts of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he lists the gifts of the Spirit. And he's talking about how there are gifts for everybody. In verse chapter 13, he's rebuking the church and says, you can you be used in the gifts all of the Spirit all you want, but if you have no love, well, then it's useless. They're just sounding brass. You need to do it out of love. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, he talks, gives instruction 
on the gifts of the Spirit. And when he's talking here, the reason that the person who speaks in tongues edifies himself is, is not known to the church. He's edifying himself, and there's nothing wrong with that. But that's what, where the gifts of interpretation comes in. I know it's not mentioned here if he goes into prophecy, but interpretation brings that word forth for the church. And now they can understand. For him that prophesied, when someone prophesies, there's no tongues given. The word of God just comes upon them and speaks forth. But Paul is mentioning the difference that the person who speaks in a not known tongue, well, he's edifying his church himself because it's not known. When it comes to prophecy, though, it edifies the church because it is known. And to edify means to build up, to grow, to bind together. The gift of prophecy is meant to build the church through the Holy Ghost. And I cannot stress enough the day and age we're living in. I know we don't have this problem in our church, as far as I know. But prophecy is to build up through the Holy Ghost. How many times have we heard of people in the past that have had issues with one another in the church, and all of a sudden one person gets up and prophesies against another, and God's going to rain down condemnation because Brother Eli did not take Spossy out at exactly 8 a.m. He took him out at 8.01. Or he had Brother Eli, or we can pick it, I'm picking on Brother Eli, he knows better. But we've seen the gift abused. People can just as easily abuse the gift of prophecy as they can the word of knowledge. Amen. But the gift of prophecy is meant to edify the church, to build it up through the Holy Ghost. Amen. What's Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18 state? Matthew 16 and 18. Matthew 16, 18. And okay, I'll go ahead and read that. And I say unto, also unto thee that thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay. Okay, so 
First, we'll have the addition of members to the church through prophecy convicting the sinner of his sin. He's talked about his life by telling him something that's wrong and that he needs to get right with God before it's too late. Perhaps you've been in a service already where you've heard the Holy Ghost call out individuals that now's the time to get right because you don't know. And there have been incidents or occasions where the Holy Ghost told people that they need to get right. They don't. They go out and they're in a horrible car accident and they don't even make it an hour later. The Holy Ghost has warned them. So we have the addition of new members to the church or go edify the church by strengthening those who are already attending the church by increasing their faith or to help them develop godly character. I remember in Bible school I had a teacher, uh, he was in it, late 70s, he turned 80, my time was left, I think 81 to 83 to be exact. But I remember him saying how when he was younger, sitting at church before he was in the ministry, and the Holy Ghost gave forth the message, and uh, he knew it was for him as it was going forth, and all of a sudden it was a good message. He's like, okay, I'll, I'll take that, that's a good message. He goes, it wasn't a rebuke or anything like that. And how many times have we sat in service and heard the Holy Ghost say that uh, though the storms of life may come our way, that he's right there to uphold us and carry us through and he'll see us through to the end? It's to increase our strength, to remind us that he is always there. Or he'll help us to develop, develop our godly character. Lean on me, trust on me, and I will bring you through. You know, normally there's a contingency involved in it that we need to rely upon him, that we need to trust him. No matter what the situation looks like, we need to place all our faith that he has it all under control. Now we are living in a day and age where we have teachers heaping onto themselves. Uh, people have the itching ears. They don't want to hear the truth of God's word, but they only want to hear the good parts. And as we said in church, most times we'll hear positive and notes. And depending on who you read, and I even read somebody last night that claimed that when it comes to the gift of prophecy, it's all positive. It'll never be negative. Well, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Mom, you just read that in 1 Corinthians 14, 24, and 25 when it's talking about um, convicting sinners of their sin. How's the Holy Ghost going to do that? Oh, you're a good individual. You just need to ask me to forgive you of your sins. No. If, if the Holy Ghost is really going to move in prophecy, nine times out of ten, he's going to tell them what's going on in their life. Or that you need to get right before it's too great. late. That's, that's leaning more towards the negative side. Why? Because he's telling them, you need to get right. You're living in sin, and the stuff you're doing, you need to stop doing it right now. People in today's society don't even like to hear that. That's negative. But the, old, the prophets of old prophesied, how many times do they deliver good messages? If we go out and read the prophets of the Old Testament, how many times were they rebuking Israel and telling them they have to get right with God? Who was it? Uh, Jose, that God came out and told them that they need to stop sacrificing the animals that they don't want because God doesn't want them. They're an abomination to them. You need to offer up the best of the best. Don't offer me those that are blind and lame and everything else. That's not what I require. What is that? That's a rebuke. That was prophecy, but it was a rebuke. It was negative in today's standard. Those people would need to go and find their safe space before it's too late because words hard. When we look at prophecy, oh, it's the truth. When we look at prophecy, a lot of times in church, it is good. God's dealing with people. You need to get right. Or uh, nine times out of ten in our church. We will hear that lean on me, trust me. But there are times that prophecy can be negative too. And if it comes back in a negative connotation, we don't need to get up and rebuke the individual who brought it forth because if God brought it forth, it's true. And we need to deal with it. We need to get things right. Prophecy is not always positive. It can be quote-unquote negative. Because if the reality of it is if we were all perfect, we wouldn't be here right now. We would have be all be in the shoes of Enoch, translated and before the throne of God. So prophecy can be both negative and it can be positive. 
What does 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 say? 2 Timothy 3, 16, we're all, we're all listening to. It is for reproof, rebuke. I don't know about you, but when I was little, if I would have got in the cookie jar when I wasn't supposed to, the rebuke I got would have been probably verbal. It might have been the first time. But if my hand would have got caught in the cookie jar, more than likely that cookie jar lid was coming down on the hand. Or there would have been repercussions with a wooden board. You know, those are things that we think about when we think about prophecy. But the Bible says that it's for reproof, for rebuke. Why? Does God chasten his children? Yeah. He punishes them if they're not doing it right. And why is that? Because he is molding us and shaping us into the image of Jesus Christ. He is working with us. And if everything would always be positive, 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 well then, in all honesty, that's part of the reason we have a bunch of brats running around nowadays. And it's not just little brats, there are adult brats too, because there have been plenty of ones that came through Walmart that I wouldn't slap the parents and not the kids because the parents needed it. But rebuke, reproof, those don't normally come forth positively in people's eyes. But they are necessary to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ it is done to edify us and to turn us into the church. And what does edify? To build up. Sometimes to build up, first we need to tear down some bad things. We cannot build a house upon a weak foundation. It would have to be torn out and redone. For exhortation, the Greek word for exhortation is paraklesis, which should sound familiar to some of us because what's one of the names for the Holy Ghost? It's not parakeet, but paraklete. And it is a legal term like a lawyer who somebody comes right beside you and walks you through. Someone who's with you every step of the way. So when we look at exhortation, prophecy comes forth to help us with our walk with Christ from time to time. Maybe he'll tell us that we need to get something right, or maybe we need to read our Bible more, or maybe we need to lean on him more or trust on him, and we are exhorted to go deeper in the things of him. And then finally we get to comfort. It comes from the Greek word um, paramuthia, and it means consolation or comfort. And once again, is that not one of the names of the Holy Ghost? The Comforter? 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 31. We don't have to turn there, but that, well, that is not taken from that verse. So John 15, 26 is the verse it's taken from. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 31 states, For ye may all prophesy one by another that ye may learn and all be comforted. So there is a comforting aspect to prophecy as well. And for the person who has received a negative prophecy, quote unquote, if they do what the Holy Ghost asks of them, they will be comforted. Because the whole purpose of the Holy Ghost is to draw us unto God, to point us to Christ. So, when it comes to the gift of prophecy, it is meant for exhortation, edification, and comfort. It is one of the vocal gifts, 
And nine times out, I shouldn't say nine times out of ten, but it is one of the most more common gifts because it is the ones that is vocally used in church is seen. Like I said, some gifts may not be seen, and for all you know, somebody may have the working miracles in their life. But guess what? Big surprise to some people, the gifts of the Spirit aren't just for use when we're having a church service or within the church walls itself. The gifts of the Spirit is meant to be used anywhere that God wants you to use them. Not just within church, but outside the church walls as well. The individual who has the gifts of healing in their life might be walking through Walmart and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost comes upon them and says, hey, you need to go pray for this person and I will heal them. The gifts are not limited. If anything, we limit the gifts. Because we say, okay, God, now church has come to use me in the gifts of the Spirit. But we don't expect you to do it on an everyday basis because sometimes we're not at church. Because there are many other gifts that God has for us. And if you have the gifts, if you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost has several gifts for you. At least one or two. But guess who it's up to to be used in those gifts? It's up to us. God, what do you have for us today? God, what is the gift that you have in my life? God, teach me to use that gift. And how do we learn the gift that God has given us? And how do we become my yearning? Simply through obedience. If God cannot trust us, how can he take us deeper in something? And if God cannot trust us with reading our Bible every day or living a godly lifestyle like we should be, how can he trust us with information? Or trust us to go deeper in that gift? Or trust us to be used whenever he wants us to use that gift? We need to be obedient in every area of our life and say, God, whatever you have for me, I want it. And I'm going to do everything I can to get closer to you, that I may know you, that I may know how to use this gift. And if we want more gifts, why should God give us more gifts if he can't trust us with the one he has? God has given us a gift, but he expects us to to learn it and to use it. Is it always easy? Absolutely not. But we need to keep striving to go deeper into things of God. We need to keep striving to become a Pentecostal powerhouse. If we don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we need to strive and keep seeking for the baptism of the Holy Ghost because it's a free gift. If we already have it, then we need to be striving and seeking God. God, what gift do you have in my life? If we know what gift we already have, or gifts, and we need to be striving, God, take me deeper in this gift. Let me become more fluent in this gift. That, I, that you may be glorified. And maybe even God give me more gifts. Now, we are lacking a great amount of gifts in the church. We really are. We have the vocal ones. Why do we have just the vocal gifts for the most part? For the most part. And I say that from natural eyes, not spiritual eyes. Because we can see the vocal gifts, the tongues, the interpretation, and prophecy. Is it because people like to be seen and heard? Is it because it brings recognition to that individual because they are the one bringing it forth? Pride is one of the greatest downfalls when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit. Pride will destroy you quicker than anything out there. Because, oh, God's using me, I'm great and mighty. No, that's not the case. The Holy Ghost is meant to be used through a humble vessel. Because it's not us. The only thing we've done is be obedient. The only thing we've done is say, God, if you want to use anybody, use me. It is the Holy Ghost that brings forth the word. It's the Holy Ghost that brings forth the tongues. It is the Holy Ghost that brings forth the healing. But why don't we see the gifts of discernment of spirits. Why don't we see the word of knowledge? Why don't we see the word of wisdom? Like I said, I'm just going through natural eyes because really a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom is not always known when it is given. 
Discernment of spirits. Somebody might have the gift of discernment of spirits that you never know it unless they reveal it to you. Because that's not something that's going to be full for well known. Gift of faith. But God, whatever you have for us, may we desire to have it like never before. May we desire to be used greatly in it. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add at this point as we close? If not, let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will continue to do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns on high, but there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below. And no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset, one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move, making himself visible if he so chooses. Anointing the pastor, he brings forth the word today, anointing the mind and his lips, Lord, that your words would just flow forth. Anoint the song leader and the musicians, Lord, as they lead us in the songs you have to sing, as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords. I pray, Lord, that you anoint our minds and our hearts to receive the word which you have for us today that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives, that we would be even farther transformed into your very image, Lord. Give us a hunger and a thirst to have more of you than ever before, a greater hunger and thirst for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the evidence speaking out of the tongues that we don't have it already. Lord, a greater hunger and thirst for more of the gifts of the Spirit, Lord, and a hunger and a thirsting that we may know how to use them, that we may go deeper, and that, that we may be used mightily for your kingdom. For it's not about us, but as Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, that the Father would be magnified and glorified. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus.